is part of the uh, Greater Capital District Teachers Reading Grant entitled uh, It's Time Has Come, Supplementary Materials uh, for Teaching the Vietnam War. Today we are interviewing, we have the pleasure to interview Mr. John Burns. I think as we go through this interview, you'll see that Mr. Burns has had a remarkable career, uh, both in Vietnam and especially his activities uh, you know, since, he, since he left the service. First, John, I want to thank you very, very much for, for doing this. Uh, Thank you. On our part. Uh, I'd like to start maybe just a little background, you know, where you were born. Basically, they asked, you, you kind of do this for genealogical purposes in case somebody uh, 10 years down the line, you know, wants to, uh, uh, maybe he's going to research your family or, you know, so just, if you could just touch on that a little bit, that would be great. I was born in uh, Cambridge, New York, which is about uh, 25 miles northeast of here. I was raised in Glens Falls, which is about 50 miles north of here. Um, my father's family is originally from Troy. Um, my grandmother's family is also originally from Troy. Um, by my father's family, I mean uh, his father, and actually his mother too. You know, they're, they're, uh, they were both originally from Troy. This has nothing to do with the topic whatsoever. Do you know the Cavaliers up here? Uh, a good friend of mine taught down St. Teresa, Don Cavalier, uh, up in Cambridge. In Cambridge? Yeah, that's where, that's I, where he lived. Uh, we, uh, we left the area when I was really young, um, <clears throat> when I was about four years old, as a matter of fact. So you didn't fish the bat until I caught the biggest trout in my life. In Only once gun. in a while. I, I, I did. Uh, I had, like I say, there was also uh, a lot of family in the Greenwich, Cambridge area, and my uncle used to fish the bat and kill all the time. I caught the, yes, my wife later. Biggest brown <coughs> trout. I was, I was shaking like this, uh, you know, when we caught it. Uh, which which go to high school? At? Went to high school in Glen Falls. Glen Falls. I uh, attended uh, St. Mary's Academy up until uh, the end of ninth grade, and then I transferred to the public school and I, I graduated from Glen Falls High. And did you go right from high school into Vietnam, or no? no. Can you kind of explain the process by which you got from Glen Falls to uh, South Vietnam? You know? Yeah, I. Um, when I got out of high school, I really didn't have any idea or intention of going to college. Uh, it wasn't, you know, anything that I that I couldn't have. It was just I didn't have that that feeling. So I went to work in a in a General Electric plant up in the Glens Falls area, and uh, that was in the in July of 1967. I graduated in 1967, and I worked there. Until early 1968, and my foreman on the job uh, was continuously trying to get me to go to college. Uh, my uh, draft uh, classification was 1A, and he said, "Look, you know, if you keep working here, you're going to end up getting drafted. So why don't you go to school?" And you know, I really didn't know whether I was going to enlist. I was going to let myself get drafted or, you know, really if I wanted to go to college or not. Then things really started, you know, hitting pretty heavy. When I, when I quit, it was, quit the GE, it was the end of February and Tet had taken place. And that was a pretty disastrous uh, event um, for different reasons than, than uh, is generally uh, mentioned. And so, at that time, I said, "Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to go to college." So I worked a couple of other jobs prior to the fall semester in 1968. And uh, in '68 or fall of '68, I went, I went to college up at Adirondack Community College. I enrolled, and I lasted about two weeks. And you know, the, the '68 was a pretty, you know hectic year. A lot of things were going on in Chicago. You know, everything was, was just coming down. And so I had a hard time reconciling going to college to get out of the draft. But at the same time, I didn't know enough about what was going on to say, yeah, I want to enlist and I want to go and I want to, you know, fight in Vietnam. So I dropped out after two weeks. Uh, there was no, you know, academic pressure or anything like that. I just said, you know, I can't 
can't do this. And it was pretty. It was a pretty tough time for me at that particular point because um, I had run into a, a girl that I had gone out with in, in high school, a girl that I had really some deep feelings for, and I still had those feelings at that time. And when I told her that I was quitting, she was also going to school. And when I told her that I was quit quitting, she offered me, you know, some money if I needed money to stay in school. She said she had, you know, money in the bank and that if money was the problem, that, you know, she'd help me out. And that wasn't the problem. Okay. And so I, you know, told her no. And that really kind of tore me up real bad because uh, I think that if I had gone, you know, stayed in school, we may have ended up getting married or whatever because, you know, we were, you know, pretty close. So after that, I started looking for work and it was almost impossible to find work. Uh, I won a classification and the fact that I was now 19, uh, nobody wanted to take me in because uh, if you went into a mill, which were basically the good paying jobs up in the area. The, if you got drafted out of that mill, you would, you know, have uh, uh, time uh, in grade and they'd have to give you your job back with seniority once you get back out of the service again. So I couldn't get anything. And, you know, my last jobs were like uh, working in a car wash and uh, selling pots and pans and vacuum cleaners, <laughs> which was, you know, that was tough. That was, that was bad news. But then, March 1969, I got drafted. Uh, you and I talked about one of the one of the purposes of doing this is to try to dispel some of those stereotypes and some of those myths that develop around uh, the typical soldier who went to uh, to Vietnam. Uh, one of the myths that you know we've talked about a great deal uh, is the myth of the uneducated. That uh, there was a quote from the book I, I can't remember exactly the title, but basically that. The war was fought by the lower classes, the uneducated people in America, to uh, for the wealthy people. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? I really <clears throat> don't agree with that. Um, as far as the un uneducated, I, I suppose there were you know pockets of uneducated, and there was a group that uh, they were targeted. They were targeted. They were, you know, uh, extremely illiterate and whatnot. But that was a very small proportion of the people who were drafted. And in, in my estimation, I, I think it was more the, the uh, well, they were. How, I, I, I don't know how to how to phrase it. It's well, what the phrase that you used before that you were. Unmotivated. The, the unmotivated. Unmotivated. Was more, more, yeah. of the, more of the point. I was thinking underachiever, but you know, I think that's you know, again the same thing. Because um, myself, I, I was a pretty smart kid in school, uh, up, except towards the end when Vietnam was really, you know, I started losing good friends of mine. In a small city like Glens Falls, you know everybody. And even though I had transferred from the parochial school, I still knew the people from from St. Mary's. Who going into the service and I played sports with them and things like that. So it, at the end, you know, I, I started sliding, but it was, I wasn't driven. I didn't have, you know, the motivation, as I say, to, to say, well, I'm going to get on the dean's list or, you know, honors, and then I'm going to go on to, you know, this school or the other school and, and, and get such and such a degree. I was, I was really, I, I wasn't motivated in that direction. And I think that that, for the most part, is, is the, the big part because, a lot of the guys that I served with over in Vietnam who were draftees were pretty smart kids. And, you know, you, you don't survive in a, in a uh, setting like Vietnam unless you got something on the ball. And uh, I think that, you know, the idea that it was a class war, I think every war, you know, you have that segment of the population who finds it, 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 uh, opportunities and advantages in the, in the service. And Vietnam was no different. You have people who are on the lower economic rung of the ladder. Um, this is like, let's take boxing, for instance. I right. mean, that's the way of stepping up in the, in the military is, 
There's also a way of doing that. So I think that the idea that you know they were uneducated, uh, it's a wrong word to, to mm -hmm. uh, attach to it, I, I think. That's a, a, almost a direct quote from, from something I, from a book I was reading, Six Days Without a Home, mm -hmm. a pretty bold statement. Had you formed any opinions of Vietnam up to that point? You know, if you put yourself, you, you receive your draft notice. Had you formed opinions as to why we were there? You obviously were fairly well informed by '68. You know, because you had Ted, you had Chicago, you had, you know, you had Abby Huffman, you had the Chicago Seven, uh, you had that terrible Democratic convention. Did you form opinions, attitudes towards the war prior to that? I had a, a, a vague opinion, um, and when I went over, it wasn't, you know. Uh, a blind person, you know, going over and not knowing anything about it. Uh, I think particularly in a, in a, in a Catholic school, uh, you are told about, you know, the atrocities that are committed against, you know, Christians and Catholics by the, the communists and the Marxist-Leninists. Uh, that did affect me and that did, you know, uh, somewhat give me a, a, a direction, a, a little bit of an incentive that so that when I did go over, you know, I wasn't just meandering around not knowing what I was doing. But the situation itself was very, very vague. We were, you know, you were hearing different opinions on, you know, who was the enemy over there, what their real nature was. And I was kind of really split. And I almost enlisted. Uh, I came very close to enlisting. You know the frustration of not being able to work and things like right. that, but I, I held off, and I think um, this may sound corny or whatever, but the thing that really impressed me to make my decision was a movie that I had seen, and it was Sergeant York. I don't know if you are you familiar Perfect, with that? Yeah. I think it was Cary Grant or Gary, no Gary Cooper Gary that yeah. uh, was in that, and the particular scene that I remember was when. He was getting ready to desert from the military. He was home on leave and he was saying, basically, I don't want to go back, I don't want to kill. I just can't do it, it's not my nature. And he went to the mountain with his Bible and his dog and he sat there and read the Bible and the one thing that impressed him was is the, the saying that, you know, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is God's. And I mean, that, to me, you know, was, was a good answer, it was a good point. And uh, that's what I finally decided on. I was going to give Caesar his chance. <laughs> I found Caesar one, I got to tell you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Your, your split is exactly, uh, I, I was teaching the Catholic schools at that time. And, uh, the split that you felt was a split, obviously, the Catholic Church as well. You know, you had uh, the, the, the radical extreme, I don't know, the, the arrogance. Uh, and then you had Archbishop Bryan from St. Teresa's, who was very strong for the war. I think Archbishop O'Connor as well. Uh, you know, did, mm -hmm. you had that split within the church as well, at least uh, during that time period. Yeah, it's a... Uh, if you were confused, look at all those big shots who were confused. Really? You know, yeah. it, it, I don't know. I, nobody, I don't think, really wants to kill um, or enjoys war. There's a lot of people that say that morally war is wrong or, you know, war is right and we must do this, that, and the other thing. And I've never seen it that way. I've always seen it as either necessary or unnecessary. And uh, even, you know, right up to today, uh, I, from what I saw in Vietnam, right up till today, I, I find that it, it, it was a necessary war, despite all of the, you know, the things that happened and there's no question that you know some people were pretty corrupt, were involved in that war as it evolved. But I think the basic impetus behind it was was it was a good uh, cause. I think that, that there were people who really understood the nature of what was going on with the communist movement in the area in Indochina itself, China, you know, the, the, the whole area there, and I think that that. You know, the majority of the people in this country, that was what they were, you know, involved in and, and supporting it for. Um, corporations, they made money over there, and there was, you know, black market over there. Um, but be 
besides all that, you know, the whole thing I think was, you know. That's typical for most schools, so isn't it? I would corporations so. in the black market. I don't know. Yeah, I that would not be sure very much. Without getting, getting in the corporation fashion, I think that they're, they're, they're prying culprit in almost every war. Um, somehow, some way, you know, the corporation uh, sees, a, sees a chance of making a profit. I think that Vietnam, um, I believe that Vietnam actually was a, as well, this book right here, uh, by uh, Bruce Palmer, General Bruce Palmer, is a, you want to lift it up? Yeah. This one here, the 25-year war. I think that that um, says it all. I think that it wasn't the Vietnam War, it was the second Indochina War, and I, I believe it began in 1954, and it took a parallel course. That there were some people who saw a lot of opportunities for, for opening markets in China. Uh, it's a long, detailed story. And then there were those who saw the threat of what was going on with Mao Zedong and China and Ho Chi Minh in, in, in Vietnam. So I think that you know it, it's a very it was a very complex war and it, it's still being sorted out right now. Somebody said I knew it was Ray who said uh, might have been you know somebody was really funny. I, I was really surprised they said when uh, oil wasn't discovered one year after the war was over, you know, that that, you know, somehow or they thought that war or, or something over there is what it was all about, you know. Uh, Country Joe and the Fish, they did a record, uh, one, you know, facing the Dirac, one, two, three, that we fight for, you know, and they, they knocked the corporations with it, you know, you know uh, <coughs> Wall Street getting money on that, you know, whole bit. Yeah. Um, but it, it, unfortunately, that became the dominating theme, that's why we were there, and everything from there was, you know, uh, you were stupid which was the thing that was laid on, you know, right. the majority of the Vietnam vets that, that came back. Uh, you know, you were really stupid to get a sucker in. Well, you know, uh, there's more to it than that. What, what day you drafted in general? The, the, the date? The date, yeah, right. It was uh, uh, March 13, 1969. And from there you went to? I went down to Fort Dix. I went through uh, eight weeks of uh, basic training and then I went through eight weeks of infantry training. Did any of that training prepare you for what was going to happen? By 68, was America training their soldiers for Vietnam? They were, but not down in Fort Dix. Um, they had a place down in Fort Polk, Louisiana, where they, you know, it was a lot like jungle uh, training down there. And they were pretty much immersed in, you know, that, that type of uh, terrain warfare. Um, Fort Dix, on the other hand, was still a, a somewhat conventional type of uh, infantry training. And uh, we did have Republic of Vietnam training where we, you know, uh, trained in villages and went through a little bit of uh, POW training, you know, ourselves being the POWs and going through some of the stuff that they might go through. Um, but I, I don't know that that is, for me anyways, uh, a critical factor. I was raised up in the Adirondacks and I understood, you know, jungle training or mountain training. Uh, I mean, as a 10-year-old kid, I was walking around on the, on the southern rim of the Adirondack Mountains by myself. I mean, my parents would let me just, you know, go and do whatever I wanted as long as I was back by dark. And so I had a sense for the woods. I had a sense for, you know, what was going on over there. And the only thing that I hadn't been prepared for was the heat and the humidity. But even that, in the middle of the summer up in the, in the Adirondacks, it right. pretty brutal. It was pretty brutal here last week. Would, would it be safe to say that the majority, I, I want to be careful, the majority <coughs> majority of kids who were drafted, received basic training, came from urban areas, were they, uh, is it safe to say that they went from basic training to a situation that they were you know, prepared for, totally unprepared for, can you prepare for it? It's, it's, you can somewhat prepare for it, okay, for, you know, the environment. And somewhat pre prepared for that, but as far as the type of warfare that we had to fight over there, that was totally different. Um, until probably the late 1969, um, it was it was guerrilla Viet Cong type of hit and run type of warfare, and Fort Dix.
base, their their infantry uh, training was conventional. So you're you, you know you're not prepared to deal with that that type of type of warfare. As a matter of fact, <laughs> when I when I went home on leave before I went to Vietnam, uh, I blew all my money for my plane <laughs> fare. Okay, um, <laughs> I figured you know hey here I go I'm going to Vietnam and you know somehow it'll work out I'll get there. Well, I blew it off and I ended up having to take a military uh, hop from Plattsburgh. And the only flight that they had going out to the West Coast was going to be leaving two days sooner than I, you know, had to leave. So I took it. And when I got out to Oakland Army Base, I checked in. Like I said, I had no money, so I couldn't go out on the town for two days or anything like that. So I checked her again. And Two days later, I was ready to go. I had my manifest, and I was with that group of guys, you know, that was getting ready to, to be shipped over. And my guys from the infantry unit that I trained with were coming in that day. They were they were checking in. And I, this is no lie. I am telling you that over the loudspeaker, while we were standing out in formation, they announced that anybody coming in from Fort Dix from that point forward would be getting either re-diverted to another duty station or sent somewhere else for retraining. And the reason was because 75% of the infantry casualties over in Vietnam were trained in Fort Dix, New Jersey. Hey, you <coughs> some confidence going? I was gone. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. Hey, how about me? Uh, you know, I'm with these guys, you know. Well, Sarah, you got your manifest and you're ready to go. So I never did see any of the guys that I ever trained with when I, when I got over to Vietnam. Um, Getting there is a minor, I, I guess it's a minor point, but it intrigues me. Uh, how did you get? How did you get over there? I flew for uh, army or no? It was uh, commercial airline. Commercial airline. Tiger Tiger Airlines. Uh, I had never heard of it before. It, was that usual for in most wars to have the soldiers fly over? Uh, no. Ray went over to TWA, for example. No. Uh, I cannot picture soldiers in World War II flying over in a TWA, or uh, I don't understand the philosophy behind that. Uh, uh, why would you know? Why were soldiers brought over? Uh, you know, we get into the thing whether they should have went over as units. Some people say yes, some people say no. Um, I, I almost think it's like teamwork, but you know, people disagree. But uh, just the whole idea of going over a commercial airline just kind of throws me. I don't understand it. Um, it's. I think they were trying to modernize the uh, transport. You know, getting there quicker and the the sea voyage, which is how most. Uh, of the troops ever, you know, got right. to uh, other other wars, um, was very slow right. and took a toll on guys. Uh, where this way you get there, I think it was a, I'm sure I think it was a 22 hour flight for me to get there. So in other words, in, and less than the, uh, than the course of a day, day. Right. you were from stateside down into the, you know, humidity of Vietnam. So it was, uh, I thought maybe the air, I must be naive. I thought maybe the Air Force would have airplanes that would fly soldiers in. Uh, I can't picture soldiers sitting on TWA with other passengers going to Hawaii. I mean, that's got to be a. No, they didn't do that. Oh, they didn't do that. No, oh, all right. You, when you went over, you were. The you went over. The whole flight was, was sorry, all military so personnel that. Right. were going over. So that, you know, I mean, the, you did go as, a, as somewhat of a, a military unit. All right. But when you got there, then you all went your own direction and, you know, whatever you assigned to, you know, you, you went there. Generally, you didn't even uh, end up going with anybody that you know. Or, you know. Um, What's your thoughts on that, do you want to I, I think that, I don't see anything wrong with that, uh, but I see a lot wrong with not sending guys over to units that, you know, they have trained from the get-go to the end. Um, you get to know each other. It, it, some say that's bad, you know, you don't want to make friends in Vietnam. Well, I, I made friends in Vietnam, and I, and, and I lost friends in Vietnam, but um, I think knowing how the guy next to you is going to react and, and being well disciplined as a team, teamwork that's is, right. is, is right. such a key thing. Coming back, I mean, it, it, it is another aspect of it, too, where, you know, generally you, you left your unit, and maybe there was another guy that was with you. In my case, there was nobody that was with me that I that I knew when I came back. Uh, that's the tough part because when they came back from uh, World War II in Korea and World War One, they had a long period of time where they could talk 
about their experiences, uh, you know, find out, you know, just what their feelings were on, on, on different things that happened. And it was kind of a de uh, diffusing period where, you know, they were able to let it go, like the teapot that's, you know, about ready to burst where they could let it go. And, 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 and it did help a lot. For, just for guys them, talking to other guys about their experiences. Yeah, it was, that's a very important thing. And, and with the Vietnam vet, on the other hand, when he came back generally, you know, bang, he was either out or he was home on leave, uh, having to go back in, you know, 17 to, you know, 30 days back to another unit. And to be thrown that quickly back into civilization in the world, uh, that's a traumatic experience in itself. It really is. And especially when, you know, the, the society that you brought back into is hostile. Uh, or at least indifferent and just doesn't want to hear anything. Yeah, that's that's point like the thing we've been developing uh, uh, in, in a moment. Do you recall what was your uh, uh, impression? Uh, it's a plane lands. And what was your first reaction to it? Did you, uh, you know, what did you see? Uh, uh, how did you react? Uh, well, we were when we got into Vietnam airspace, <coughs> it was monsoon season. Okay. <laughs> You had all I didn't know that. You had all fucked right. You get it. I was right down in it. Well, I'm sitting next to the window, and we're getting close. I'm seeing these flashes. It's nighttime, and I'm seeing these flashes off in the distance. And you know what? I'm used to you know the war, the war movies of World War One, World War Two. You know, you see the artillery going off up in the distance and just big flashes and everything else. And I'm like, oh no! And I thought we were coming right down in the middle of this big battle. Guy behind me starts laughing. I said, "Well, what's so funny?" He says, "It's monsoon season. That's lightning." He says, hey, "Isn't artillery going off or anything like that?" It's oh, real. Oh, so that's nice to know, you know. So we did. We came down and landed, and it, it was nighttime, and it was hot, and humid. And, I mean, it just you know hit you as soon as you got there. That's they we get uh, taken away from the, the airstrip and put on these buses with these screens on them, you know, that, so that they couldn't toss uh, grenades into the buses, and pretty much uh, we went through these deserted streets, uh, mostly they were shut down at night. Uh, to control this was in Saigon? This was in uh, Benoit, Benoit Army Base where I landed. It was pretty well shut down for, I guess every night they shut it down to control VC activity, so, you know, I mean, it was just desolate through these old streets that we were going through, and it was, it was scary. I, I didn't come into the Vietnam like the, the movie, uh, I believe it was Poutine, uh, you yeah, know, where you right. come by the body bags right. going one way and you're coming in. That, right. that didn't happen to me. Uh, I didn't see any of that. Um, but it was a scary, it was really scary, uh, especially at that particular point. Uh, casualties were mounting at that time, 19, early 1969. When I got drafted, it was the highest draft for that month. For a month that they had ever had. Um, about halfway through my tour over there, it was uh, there was I think 565,000 people that were there, and that was the highest troop yeah. concentration of, that they had ever had over there. What, what month did you leave? Right? August. August of 16, 69, 68. Yeah. I still had that memory. About 75 percent of the casualties. Fort Dix, <laughs> yeah, the coming from Fort oh, Dix, and uh, I would say, luckily, perhaps, uh, I was assigned to an armored cavalry regiment, so I didn't go to an infantry unit. I was attached to the 11th Armored Cab, and they employed me as an infantry scout over there. <coughs> so that that was, in a sense, good, but in another sense, you know, I was down on the ground all the time, way out. In of these guys. And, you know, I was the one that had to go in and sort of scout out the bunker complexes and, and take down ground patrols. After, after I'd been there for a while, uh, I think I'd been there about three months, they sent me through sniper school in Vietnam. So I went through uh, 21 days of sniper school while I was over there. So, it, Is that something that uh, you volunteered for? It no. just happened? No, I, well, I didn't, I didn't turn it down. My CO asked me if uh, I would go back through. It was an 
experimental thing that they were doing with, with 11th Armored. Uh, they didn't have any of their own snipers, so they sent me to a 1st Cal, 1st Cav. They had a they had a sniper school, so I went through that. And they were the 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 Cav was on the, the unit I was with. We were on the Cambodian border right from the get go when I got there. They were, they were on the Cambo Cambodian border at the time, and they were trying uh, counterinsurgency uh, type of warfare. It was a it was a mix of conventional. My, my feelings are that it worked pretty well. I was, you know, I was professional at what I did. Uh, I wasn't a, uh, a good military man. I was a good soldier. Uh, I, you know, I'm here to do a job. And my, my main objective being there was to save as many guys as I possibly could by doing the job that I was trained to do as good as I could do it. So you basically went ahead of whatever the unit was. Did yeah. you work by yourself with other guys? Sometimes I worked by myself. Sometimes I worked with uh, small patrols. And, and sometimes I'd take down maybe five or six guys uh, on sniper teams. There was three of us. There was myself, an automatic rifleman, and, and a radio man. So, you know, a lot of times it was isolation. And a lot of times I'd travel with them, you know, especially if we were, uh, uh, they, they had radio to us that there was activity going on us to get there in a hurry. This was, just, in a sense, we were very mobile. We could, you know, get there in a hurry. Self-contained unit. We had our, you know, sea rations and everything right in the vehicles, so that you know, we were we were pretty mobile. And we had our own mortar uh, tracks with us, and we had a headquarters company that was uh, big tanks, and they had big guns with them, so that you know they could up and move, and in, in a four-hour period, they could be packed up and move into a, another location. Pretty well contained, self contained unit, and uh, get around, do some damage. Did, did you have any experiences you think might be uh, appropriate for this, uh, for this type of an interview? Or, uh, well, <coughs> I don't know, you know, uh, really what's, I, I don't want to, you know, speak of any, and, you know, tell war stories. Yeah, I, guess, like that, that. I didn't want to, that's just specifically why I asked the question. Yeah. You know. If the kids want to read war stories, they can look them up. You know, I, the things the things that impress me now, okay, as I look back on my on my uh, tour of duty over there, is that what I'm hearing and what I, what I see getting public, um, being highlighted by the by the by the media and even Hollywood are you know like atrocities and, and, and incompetence, and, you know things like that. It was the exception, and in, with my my unit, I never saw atrocities. I mean, we we on the border, the Cambodian border, uh, there were, weren't that many villages, but the ones that we did have contact with, we always always had good relations with. Um, you know, there was a tension. We knew that some of them were being caught, uh, but we didn't bother them, and they didn't bother us because we were, you know, I mean, we were engaged on the border with NBA regulars. They were the hardcore, well-trained troops, disciplined troops from up in, up in North Vietnam. So the Viet Cong, uh, we, did, we didn't bother them, they didn't bother us. We let the South Vietnamese take care of that when, you know, whenever there was a problem. Um, with, the, with the kids, we got, you know, for me, I remember when we did get near a village, they'd come out and they'd have their little trinkets and, you know, their little, you know, their things of coke and whatever, you know. They'd, they come out and try to, you know, deal with us. And sometimes the, you know, the uh, sergeants and, and, the, and the officers didn't like our mingling with them, and they would come out and, you know, razz them a little bit. But for the most part, we got along with them real good. And for me, it was, even though know, it was they were Vietnamese people, it was my link to the to the world, what we call the world back here. That's what we call uh, being back home. In that those kids were my link, to, because kids are kids, and you know you'd see them laugh. You know, even though you couldn't communicate with them, with them very good, you know, it was still they were kids, and it was good to see them smile and laugh and, and, and fool around. Uh, there were a few incidents, but you know they were they were small and really inconsequential. I, 
guess it doesn't sell papers, so that's why you don't hear about that type of thing. There's uh, the guy who was telling me about the, oh, we used to go up once a week up to a, a, a camp or someplace with kids. They used to, uh, they bring food up probably illegally, and they, you know, they built a playground and this kind of stuff. It doesn't sell papers, so you don't hear. You know. A lot of that went on, and I think that that was more the rule, you know, Number one, because they did want to want to try to pacify the South Vietnamese population. And number two, you know, we were all 19, 20, 21, whatever, and you know, just kid yourself. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and we had no, we harbored no ill feelings towards the Vietnamese. I mean, what was your attitude towards you? Some of them were were you know real nice, um, and. You know, they'd be playful, and, you know, just joke around, whatever. Uh, some of them were standoffish. Some of them were just out to get your money. You know, but again, I didn't deal that much with the villagers. Excuse me, our unit, as I say, it was a self-contained, pretty much a self-contained unit, and we went sometimes two and three months at a time in the bush where we would be resupplied by helicopters. So we didn't, you know, go back to the villages. We didn't really go back to the fire bases, except on rare occasions. So we didn't have that much contact uh, with, the, uh, with the civilians themselves. Um, so most of my experiences, were, even when I was in the rear, most of my experiences were good experiences. They, you, know, you just relate to them like a human being, and, and they relate it back to you like a human being. Was uh, probably because you spent so much time you know, away from Centers did uh, this, you know, this question may not have any, any importance. Uh, I, I'm curious about news if you received news, uh, how you received it. Uh, a lot of different ways. I, we would get, you know, letters from home that would, you know, tell us what uh, uh, several major engagements that we had. Um, they made the news back home, and then, you know, my father or my brother grandmother would send me, you know, a clipping or say, hey, you know, they were talking about your unit on the, on the news. Um, did this really happen? You know, um, we got uh, every now and then, you know, when our mail come out, we would get, you know, like stars and stripes or, you know, something like that that would, you know, fill us in on supposedly, supposedly what was going on. You know, it was, it was one of those things. You, you, you look at the stars and stripes and you figure, you know, somebody, you know, is Getting a story, whether it's completely accurate or not, you know, that's another question. But at least it gave you an idea of what, you know, what was going on. Um, and even uh, the grunts, the, the infantrymen out there could have a, a little transistor radio that they could, you know, slide into their pack somewhere. Uh -huh. And you could pick up, you know, uh, radio uh, Saigon or something like that. You could, I don't know what, what, what the name of the, the stations were. I don't know that. Even out on the border, we could pick up some of those stations. Um, you're taking chances when you know you're out. Yeah, you moving around. Yeah, yeah, you don't so, want it too loud. Yeah. So, but I, I, I do remember one day where, where we set up a blocking force. Uh, this was the armor itself, and I was on you know one of the vehicles. I, I did spend a good portion of time on the vehicles, and we were set up as a blocking force. And there was another unit that was driving the NBA down our way. And so we were, you know, acting like a kind of a wedge. <coughs> and I'm sitting up there on guard behind the 50 caliber machine gun with the, the radio helmet on, right? And I've got the uh, uh, transistor going, and i got the earplug in my ear, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just <laughs> going like this, and I'm listening, and all of a sudden the news came on, right? And the announcer said, Ladies and gentlemen, the New York Mets have just won oh. the World Series. This is 1969, <laughs> right? Yes. The, 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 and I, I said, hey, you guys! <laughs> like this, and, <laughs> like this, and I push the thing back. Hey, uh, you know, the Mets just won the World oh. Series, you know? And I yelled it out. Now, they, if, if anybody was coming down through, any of the enemy were coming down through, they probably heard that, but right. I don't know if they did or not. Maybe they were Mets fans. So. Yeah, so, you know, it was, it was interesting, you know, that, sitting out there in the, on the border area like that, that, you know, you get that kind of news. You know. Again, you know, you're, you're half home and half, you know, yeah. wishing you were home and, and, and there. And it, was, it, it was funny. And I got a razzle for that one. <laughs> what, 
were you aware of while you were in there of any, uh, you were aware of protests before you went? Mm -hmm. uh, were you aware of any protests uh, while you were there? Yeah, that that come from in the mail from home, and there would be new guys coming into the unit all the time. Bring yeah, they'd be bringing the information in, and some of them would come into the unit with with that attitude themselves, and that was somewhat demoralizing sometimes, you know, and it created dissension in the ranks sometimes. But um, for the most part, it wasn't really too bad. Did protest in America have a visible effect that you could see in Vietnam? Well, uh, you couldn't judge it at the time that, you know, it was having this effect, um, but I believe it did. Um, you know, I mean, there were times when Charlie was ready to throw in the towel and the protests and the, and the demonstrations would put, you know, the United States in a, in a particular uh, position, and it would give the Viet Cong and the NBA an incentive to dig in a little bit deeper and hold on just a little bit longer. Um, I think there were several times uh, before 1973 when we could have forced them to negotiate and to settle. And I think we, you know, could have visibly and quite clearly accomplished the goals that, that we had set out to accomplish. And again, I'm, you know, I, it's hard for me to, you know, kind of separate when I was there from, from all right. of the studying and the research Correct. that I have done s right. since right. then. So uh, I, I don't really think that any one particular person could say that they saw, you know, what it was doing except to say that, you know, hey, they're still here. And no matter what we throw at them, they seem to be, you know, holding, especially in the border region, especially over in Cambodia and somewhat in Laos too. Laos was more mountainous than Cambodia was, and in Cambodia they could they could build some real heavy-duty bunker complexes. They had what they called cities built right on the border, and we used to get hit all the time. They used to come across the border and hit us, and, and they just booked back into the, into the uh, Cambodia, and we get close to this imaginary line, this right. thing on a map, and right. we get told, okay, that's it, no further. Uh, you went there, that's Cambodia. Um, that's what's going to be the Nixon bomb that Cambodia won in 70, <coughs> 71? Well, um, yeah, I believe, I, I'm not exactly sure. Well, Kent that, State was one. Kent State was 1970. Uh, that was, right, that was, was, it was late 69, early 70, because Kent State was a reaction to Nixon's uh, raids in Cambodia. So yeah, there was, there was um, a lot of bombing prior to that, and I think there was uh, uh, quite a bit more afterwards, right. too. To, uh, well, there was a secret bomb. Yeah, such a good secret to, <laughs> to, to, to the public. Yeah, public. right. I mean, we, we knew it because we were on the border, and when those B 52 raids come in, you knew it. I mean, you could feel the, the ground rumbling from 20 miles away. You knew what was going on. So. You hold with the theory, John, that, that the protest uh, definitely prolonged and hurt the war effort. I, I think so. Um, I guess some people would say that's wonderful. Uh, you know, uh, that gave. Ho Chi Minh's troops. Uh, Ho Chi Minh died in 1969, September 1969. But you know, I gave uh, the rest of his troops, those people who took over afterwards, uh, the victory. And some people wanted that victory all along. So, you know, but my my feeling is that it did prolong the war, and, and, and I believe that it cost a lot of American lives. And I think it cost a lot of innocents, uh, Vietnamese lives too. Um, when I was there from like I say, from August of 69 to August of 1970, um, the South Vietnamese people seemed to be rallying and they seemed to be, you know, uh, getting their act together. And there wasn't that hatred and that bitterness that everybody talks about. But I didn't see it. Uh, and the South Vietnamese Army, while we were on the border, we were taking, you know, the brunt of the, the heavy action on the, on the border, all the borders. Um, they were getting their act together. Eventually, in, in 71, 72, the Vietnamese gave a good, good account of themselves. But we cut, you know, cut off the money to them towards uh, 75. And, you know, why walk around with an empty gun, right? Uh, that's, they, had, they had no alternative. They, they really did. And I think that that goes back to the original strategies of the war. It was originally, you 
you know, the concept was uh, conventional warfare, and the Vietnamese themselves told the United States, hey, this is wrong. We used to control our guerrillas, and we don't fight them that way. We know how to fight them in the United States, you know, although we had examples of how to fight a guerrilla warfare, didn't, didn't pay any attention to them and didn't need to stop Vietnamese, so they somewhat kind of you know, said, hey, well, if they want to do it that way, we'll let them. I believe, I, from what I read, and, you know, a lot of the things that I've come across. But I was, excuse me, I was, uh, I was with the, the invasion force that went, in, that went into Cambodia. I was, uh, May 1st was the day that we went across the border. Uh, we went across about 7 o'clock in the morning, and we spearheaded one part, one part of the invasion force. <coughs> and I was, I was, wounded the, uh, the third time we got hit that morning uh, and met it back down. And, uh, I think it was about a day later when I was in the hospital, uh, I was watching the TV uh, and I remember Senator Fulbright was on, on the news and he was ranting and raving about the, the, the invasion and I was really upset. You know, we have been taking casualties. All the units along the border have been taking casualties. And for him to, you know, say that there's nobody there and we have no reason going into a, a neutral country, Cambodia was not neutral. The North Vietnamese had declared it not neutral. You know, their actions. Yeah, exactly. They were, Cambodia allowed them to be there. Exactly. Yeah. They had abrogated their, their, their rights to uh, neutrality, and they had abrogated those rights long before the United States became they built the Ho Chi Minh Trail and they began building it in 1959. And it came right straight down through Cambodia and branched off into you know, different parts of Vietnam. So they were getting a heavy, heavy amount of their uh, supplies from the north along the, Cambodia, or along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And we worked one right on the end of one part of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, one of the main trails that came in the country. And they were also getting supplies coming in from Phnom Penh. And this is supposedly a neutral port that they were bringing in arms. They were not bits and pieces of things that you assemble into arms, they were arms. And the United States knew it. They knew what was going on. So we were actually being set up on the, on the border to, you know, just fight a no-win situation. And then when we amassed on the border the night before, which is one of the most incredible experiences I've ever gone through, um, scared, terrified, but at the same time, you know, saying it's about time. And uh, I remember uh, casualty figures uh, after the, well, my unit went in for about 60 days and came back and back out a little bit further north where they went, went in. Tons and tons and tons of supplies and uh, the number of uh, NBA soldiers who were killed and captured was, you know, in the, in the thousands. It was an, an incredible uh, incursion. And our casualty figures dropped. Automatically they dropped. And that's something you know, the people don't hear an awful lot how successful that was. All they hear, hear about is the invasion of the neutral country. And as far as Kent State, well, I feel bad. And, and, and I you know, feel bad for the, the kids and, the, and, the, and their parents the, the, of the kids that got killed out there. They were wrong. Beliefs. Okay, I don't say that they were wrong in going out and doing what they did because, you know, they, they did believe that they were, you know, protesting for a good thing. I have a hard time with the professors and the, you know, uh, media who encourage these kids to go out and do this. And I think that some of them are just as culpable and, and guilty as the, the National Guardsmen who, you know, allow these kids kids they have live rounds in their, in their, in their weapons. Um, it was a tragic thing and, and you know that what they were saying was, was absolutely wrong and it was false. And again that was another major setback in, 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 in the effort. You want to take a break for a minute? Sure. Well, sure let's uh what do you think boss can we take a break for a minute? <coughs>